Hello, everyone. Welcome. I am hoping that as you arrive, there you all come. Hello, good evening, and welcome. Here comes everyone popping into my screen. Hello, hello. I am privileged to be with you. For those of you who have not yet met me, my name is Mary Beth Scallon. So Mary Beth is my given name. Scallon is my family name. However, over time, people have shortened my given name. So now they call me by my initials. They call me MB. So please feel free to call me MB. I am delighted to be with you. I appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy lives to join us today. And I will thank them again at the end, but I'm very grateful to your FAMER team, the folks who uh, work for ASU MENA FRI are excellent, and it's a privilege and a joy to work with them. So before we begin, I want to do one bit of housekeeping with all of you. I want to take a comfort break, a prayer break, about halfway through our session. I was thinking of doing that at about 6.50 your time. 6.52 to be exact. If that works for you, wonderful. But would anyone like to propose a different time for our 10 minute break? Does 6.52 work for pretty much everyone? It looks like it might. Yeah. All right, great, thank you so much. I will set my alarm for about two minutes before We'll take our break, we'll take a 10 minute break. And of course, if you need a couple of extra moments at the end, that is fine. I know you will come back and join us when you can. So hello and welcome. We have gathered here today to take a look at cultural sensitivity. And one of the tools that we will need today is something to write with. So you could use blank paper and pencil. You could also use your phone or computer. But at some point, I will ask you to make some lists. So if you could gather writing implements now while I'm speaking, that would be excellent. So this session is called Cultural Sensitivity. And Famer knows very well that you are all extremely busy, that you are maintaining your professional careers as you undertake this fellowship. So they are very careful about the material that they include in your training. It has to be worthwhile or it is not worth the time. So they have elected to spend time on cultural sensitivity, which begs a question, why? Why is this worth so many hours of your time? Over time, we believe that all of us are going to be called upon to work more and more in multicultural environments. This seems to be the way that the world is going. Working with those whose cultural values and assumptions and practices are different than our own requires a very specific set of skills. The good news is these skills can be learned and practiced and then integrated into our professional lives. These skills, Famer calls cultural competency. So they have borrowed the term competency from medical education. They call these cultural competency. Cultural competency is the end of a long process, like pretty much every competency in medicine. And the beginning of that process is what we call cultural sensitivity. So today we will dive in to cultural sensitivity on our journey toward cultural competency. Many of the things we'll discuss today, you may already know. Many of the behaviors you may already use. But one of my jobs at FAMER is to take processes that are unconscious, intuitive, and bring them into the conscious mind 
so that you can then make decisions about them and that you can alter them in any way that you choose. So I've been throwing around these terms, cultural sensitivity, cultural competency. Let us define some of these terms. So we have an agreed upon pool of information. We all understand what we're talking about. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. My internet is a little tricky. So please take a look at this offering from me. This is how I would like to define culture for our work today. And what I'd like you to focus on in this definition is the idea that these assumptions are deeply embedded. So my culture is a part of my self. It helps me form an identity, both individually, but also within my society. And these assumptions about culture are so much a part of me that they can be difficult to see. So again, one of my jobs is to take some of our ideas about culture from the unconscious mind and bring them into the conscious mind. So for today, I'd like this to be our working definition of culture. Now let's take a look at another one. Let's see if we can get here. Cultural sensitivity. Cultural sensitivity is a mind thing. It is a thought. So for our purposes, I want to define it as an awareness of my assumptions about culture. And furthermore, an awareness that my assumptions are different than your assumptions. So cultural sensitivity, the beginning of our journey toward cultural competency is an awareness, it is a thought, as opposed to cultural competency. The end of our journey is this set of behaviors that I spoke about before. And these behaviors allow me to more successfully interact with people whose culture is different than mine. So just read through this one more time to cement it in your brain. I also want to share with you our goals for this session. So please take a look at these. And I'd like you to especially pay attention to the third goal, anticipate how differing values could contribute to conflict. Our cultural values are some of the deepest parts of culture that provide a foundation for our identity as individuals in our identity in society. Sometimes in a cross-cultural setting, those values come into conflict. And it is very helpful to make ourselves aware of that possibility. It can help us deal with conflict and de-escalate escalate conflict before it becomes a serious problem. All right, now I'm going to bring you back to me because I miss you. I miss seeing your faces, there you are. And of course, if you are able, please turn on your cameras. If you cannot, I understand. I know that all over the world, Wi-Fi is an issue, so no worries. So, I mentioned that cultural values being a very deep part of our identities can lead to conflict. I want to explore that more deeply and we're going to focus on cultural values for the majority of this session. In my experience, cultural values underlie most cross-cultural conflict. So in a moment, we're going to do a role play. 
And to prepare for this role play, we will be breaking up into three small groups. I'm going to give you the instructions for this role play verbally. Then I will put a slide up on the screen with the instructions and you can take a picture of it. You can take a screenshot to remind yourself of the instructions. But first I will give them to you right now. Imagine that all of us are members of a community that contains three different cultures. We will call them the red culture, the blue culture, and the green culture. Each of these cultures has a very particular set of cultural values that are different from one another. We have just learned that the federal government is going to give us a grant to enact one public project. Now, our community has many levels of income, but no one here is rich. Everyone here must work for a living. We could really, really use this money from the government, but the challenge is we can only do one public project and there are many projects that we would like to do. So as a group, we must decide which of these many public projects we are going to get money for. The projects are as follows. We could get a set of public toilets, which we do not have currently. We could get a daycare for infants whose parents must work, which is most of our community. We could get a shelter for people who do not have homes. We could get a nursing home for elderly people whose children must work. Or we could get a food bank for people who are undernourished. All of these projects would be helpful. We need all of these things. We can only have one. So when you break into small groups, your task is as follows. You will have a moderator. We have three moderators and I will mention them briefly in a moment. Your moderator will describe to you the central values of your culture, either the red culture, the blue culture, or the green. Please be assured all of these cultures are completely imaginary and they are not based on any real world culture. Your moderator will describe the culture to you and make sure that everyone understands. Then next, you will discuss with your group which of these many projects you think is the best one to do. I'll ask you to come up with three very strong arguments as to why that project is the best one. I will ask you to decide how you're going to present your recommendations to me as the mayor of our community and to the large group when we regather. That is it. You will have 15 minutes to go through all of those tasks. Moderators, your job is to keep your group on task, to keep them on time, and to take notes about all of their ideas. So our three moderators are as follow, as follows. For the blue group, we have Bassem Alhadi. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. For our green group, we have Gada Halal. Not Gada Hussein, but Gada Halal. Thank you, Gada. And for our red group, we have Reem El Nawaga. I have mispronounced your last name, Reem. I apologize for my terrible American accent. But Reem will be the moderator for our red group. So before I put up the slide that has all of these instructions on it, what questions do you have? No questions so far. Excellent. So moderators, oh yes, there is a question. Yeah, uh, what's the budget for e for this project? Oh my goodness, no one has ever asked me that before. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah, no problem. Mm. 
I don't have a monetary number, but I would say the budget is enough to complete the project in an excellent fashion, but there is only enough money for one project. Does mm -hmm. that work, Iman? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I will have to come up with a number for the next time we do this seminar. Thank you very much for that. All right. I'm now going to put up the slide that has all of these instructions on it. Oh, someone also, Samreen asked the time for the project. I would say it will take at least three months. It's going to be a very large project, but when it's finished, it will be perfect. So I'll put up a slide with these instructions. We'll leave the slide up for about 30 seconds so that everybody can take a screenshot of it. And then can Shaima will question, break us. Please? I'm sorry. Uh, I want to know the percentage of the population in each uh, uh, of the children population and the elderly population among the communities uh, to know the percent regarding the whole uh, population. Oh, my goodness. This is one of my delights of working with science-based minds, that you think of things I have never thought of before. I would say we probably have quite a large percentage of both children and elderly. I would go so far as to say one-third of our population are children, one-third are elderly. So for the purposes of this exercise, let us go with those numbers. And by default, the, the third third is the, the working population? The working population is only a third. And I think this is part of the reason that we need these government funds. We do not have enough workers. We are not bringing in enough money. Okay. May I ask another question, please? Of course. Uh, the same as the homeless. Are they very prevalent among, among this uh, community? I would say that homeless people are not particularly prevalent. Perhaps they are 15%. That is high, um, but it is not as high as in other parts of the world. I would say about 15%. That is a very relevant question. I appreciate that question. Also, Aisha is asking, how could we homologize the groups to demonstrate the differences in decision-making? Ah. I think that that will become clear once we regather in the large group. Thank you, Aisha, for that question. All right, now I am going to put up the instructions. We'll look at them for about 30 seconds. We'll break into small groups. Once you are in small groups, you will have 15 minutes to complete your tasks. Uh, moderators, have you already received your culture slip that describes your culture? Yes. yes. Yeah. Excellent. I assumed that you had. All right. Here comes your instructions. Good luck, people. One moment. Nothing. Thank you. My Wi-Fi is a little slow today. I apologize. Does anyone need more time to take a photo of the instructions? Excellent. All right, Shaima, I think that we can break people into three small groups. Okay, okay, okay.
Thank you, Shaima, for working to get folks into those groups. I know it is so hard. You put them in and they pop back out and then you put them in and they pop back out. We have this problem all the time in the US. So thank you for your good work. دكتور إيمان بستأذن حضرتك دكتور إيمان دكتور إيمان أيوة أستاذ شيماء حضرتك ده حضرتك يا دكتور الحمد لله بخير الحمد لله إيه، تمام هو في رساله بس بتظهر لحضرتك ممكن حضرتك تدخلي بيها الروم طيب هي مش موجوده دلوقتي ممكن حضرتك تبعتيها لي تاني تمام ماشي اوكي شكرا العفو الرسالة ظهرت لحضرتك يا دكتورة إيمان؟ أيوة يا أستاذة شيماء تمام أيوة يا دكتورة زينة تمام بس هي بس حضرتك ما دخلتيش الروم لا أنا دخلت روم اسمها روم فور تمام طب هدخل حضرتك دلوقتي أوكي Thank <laughs> you. 
معلش يا دكتورة زينب ممكن حضرتك تضيفيني تاني أنا مش عارفة ليه بدخلها وبطلع منها على طول تمام حاضر
So it looks like we have about 30 seconds left. And uh, then we can bring folks back in. Thank you so much, everyone, for your hard work. I know how hard it is to keep people in breakout rooms. Thank you. Thank you. You're doing a great effort in the session. I think everyone is enjoying till now. Oh, I hope so. But it's funny, uh, keeping people in breakout rooms, it actually reminds me, Magdalene, of chasing children. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's remind, it reminds me of the same thing. <laughs> yes, you have to run after them all the time. Yes, and and, and putting their toys in the same place. And <laughs> you, put, <laughs> you put them in their place and then they <laughs> spread it over the whole room again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, I think we can bring them all back. Okay. ممكن يا شيماء نرجعهم من ال تمام يا دكتور هم بيرجعوا بس بياخدوا من شكرا يا شيماء العفو Welcome back, everyone. We are all returning. Excellent. I think we are all back. Thank you for your work with your small group. And I apologize to those of you that had trouble staying in your group. Um, Zoom can be very frustrating. So welcome everyone to this town meeting. I, as you know, am the mayor of this town and we have a remarkable opportunity to receive some federal money to enact a public project towards public health. But it's going to be a difficult decision for us. So I would like to invite each group to speak one at a time, give us your recommendations. And at the end, after everyone has spoken, we will hold a vote as to which project we will undertake. So let me invite first our blue group. So Bassem, if you would like to uh, present your views to the group, that would be wonderful. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So as a, a blue group representative, I want to welcome uh, the mayor, and uh, yellow group and the green group. Uh, we are trying to get uh, some project will be helpful for all our community, and it wouldn't be the last one to be the first, but it wouldn't be the last one. So uh, our proposal is to get the nursing home, and we believe this is essential for our community, not all, not only our group, for the whole community, because as you know, third of our uh, population are above uh, or senior population. And we need to pay them back. So they build this community and we need to build to, to pay them back. Same time, it will give the rest of the, their families time to uh, work and uh, to get profit so they can um, feel valued in the community. And it might be good initiative that we together as uh, three uh, groups to fund an, another project and they'll make it kind of partial prof profitable. But I'll talk about this later. So my first argument here is a statistic. So a third of our population needs it. And the, the other thing is, I am as a middle grade, a middle age, when I know that I'll I'll have a space or the, the government will care for me, I'll feel more loyal. So second point, it's act of kindness, and it will be um, on the balancing measure, we, can, we might uh, start another project. Third, there will be some return of investment uh, from this, because uh, this will uh, free more uh, carers to work in the community and produce more, and will be for the uh, overall uh, goodness. So I wouldn't go in details now, but I will be happy to receive questions unless you want to ask me something. Thank you very much, Blue Group. That was 
very interesting. I appreciate how many arguments you put forward to support your position. Fascinating. So I have one question for you. Um, you spoke about allowing, if we did the nursing home, that would free up people who are working to work more, which I think is excellent. Uh, then you mentioned perhaps the groups get together and fund another project. Can you tell us a little more about that? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. So we have kind of the main project and some uh, branch projects. So mainly we are talking about how we can make sure that our problems could be a solution itself. For example, we have uh, unemployed people who might be potentially um, uh, homeless or vulnerable groups. So we are proposing to give them training so they can work in the nursing home so to allow them jobs. Ah. Meantime, yeah, meantime, so for we need the, our senior citizens to have some family quality time. So we might uh, invite children to spend some time with them in the morning. So we are trying to tackle more a lot of problems with one solution. So this will be one of this. Part of this as well uh, uh, for the main project, we will open for investment from people if they want to uh, put some investment in this project and there will be some uh, fund coming back if, for, for the medical care and the health care assistance or if we have for parking, for example. So kind of integrated approach. Individual investment. So let me reflect back to you what I have heard to make sure it is accurate. So your arguments to do a nursing home for elderly persons include paying them back for the effort they put in on your behalf, um, taking care of this third of the population, it's a large chunk of the population, allowing their families to work more so they don't have to take care of them. It is an act of kindness, of course, which is a foundational value of our society. It would foster a kind of loyalty and gratitude toward the government. Um, there would be a possibility to give jobs to the unemployed at the nursing home, and also to engage children in getting to know the parents, the grandparents at the nursing home. And there is a possibility for individual investors to put money into the community and to receive a return on their investment. Is there anything that I missed? No, you did a great job. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very powerful arguments. Um, well done, Blue Group. We appreciate that. So Blue Group obviously is advocating for the nursing home. Let us now hear from our green group. So Gada, hello, yes. if you would present. Hello. hello. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, we found a very uh, you know, difficulty in uh, uh, to have a consensus about which project uh, uh, we can uh, protect, yani we can protect or we can uh, devote our uh, budget to it. Uh, but at the end, the majority agree on the uh, nursing home for elderly also as well. Okay. Oh. Uh, I think that uh, the, our difference uh, that we are come from different. We have uh, Indian, I think we are some Egyptian, some other nationality. So actually, our values reflect our these arguments that come from any you know, difference in our values and belief, our definition of the vulnerable group itself. However, we uh, we agree finally on that shelter for uh, for. Uh, um, uh, sorry, nursing care for elderly. And uh, in addition to all what Dr. Bassin said, I need to add two things. Yes. First, first uh, uh, we can uh, utilize this uh, uh, nursing home for elderly to to benefit the, yani, utilize this elder one to take, a, yani, act as a daycare for the infant itself. They are okay. elder. They are not handicapped. They need some just a supervision. So why not we can make a, a nursing a home for elderly? At the same time, these elder people take care of the uh, infant for uh, mother worker, working mother. Okay. Again, they are not handicapped people. So 
what if you can utilize their effort to cook food and give this food for the people, the poor people? So it is one project. I can utilize it with uh, some uh, management, uh, some uh, infrastructure, added infrastructure to add uh, like two projects in, in uh, yeah, three projects in one. Okay, it's a nursing home for elderly. We can utilize their effort to uh, take care of the infant for uh, working mother and cooking food for um, for poor people. Well, thank you very much, Green Group. I see we have that. Uh, Basem, you have your hand up. What would you like to say? Uh, thank you, Ghada, for supporting our uh, so uh, our proposal. <laughs> so we have to to together. Just. Uh, uh, just, I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, confrontational, but I'm trying to be devil advocate. You know yourself, uh, to go to nursing home, it means that you need someone to take care of you. So it means that like, if you are able to take care of someone else, you don't need to be in the nursing home. Like I have colleagues working for me, they are 70 and 80, and they are still fit and active. So going to nursing home means that you might need, um, or they definitely need care. That's why we are freeing uh, their families from this. So I think, yes, we can do this, but we cannot depend much on them. So if, I don't know if this makes sense or not. Like, uh, we wouldn't be able to expect a lot of them to be caring of the kids, which is a huge responsibility, or um, caring, catering food for uh, people which need a lot of supervision and uh, uh, a lot of uh, work and statistics. So yes and no. But uh, again, I'm trying to be devil advocate, sorry. But okay. in my belief, uh, the nursing care for elderly, uh, not necessarily elder one, not necessarily to be need, uh, need uh, health supervision or uh, have a disease. Some of them may join this shelter or the uh, uh, home just to be a social, just to be with others, just to talk and have a social life because they, uh, their children, their son and daughter are not uh, free enough to sit with them, to, to remi remind them with the time of their drugs or remind them now it's time to eat, now it's time to go out, now it's time to uh, wash and something like that. So uh, the nursing home, not necessarily not, not uh, like, like hospice, okay? It's, it's home to take care with elder people. Many of our parents and grandparents uh, when they are, when we are, uh, yani, late uh, to visit them or to call them, as they said, "Okay, I'll go to, to nursing home uh, to find someone to talk with." Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yeah, the emotional aspect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You are so kind, Doctor Rada. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes. Doctor can I add something? Sorry, I, I can't use my hand. Unless I think I, I do agree with Doctor Rada. Unless they are uh, have, having dementia or Alzheimer. We can do both projects, yeah. Well, what strikes me too, Gada, is that perhaps the ideas of the blue group and the green group come together so that some of the workers in the nursing home perhaps are people who are currently unemployed and are younger, and they can be supplemented by the residents of the nursing home. So I see ways to kind of weave these ideas together for success. Thank you, Green Group. Very strong arguments, very strong ideas. We have about four minutes before we take our break. So let us hear from the Red Group. And Red Group, um, this would be Reem. And if you need more time than we have before our break, we will resume with you again after the break. So Reem, let us hear from you. Um, okay, I have shared actually my screen. Um, we use the... <laughs> We use the red the color of our culture to be like to discuss the world signs if we don't have such a project. Actually, everyone is agree on everyone in my group agree on food banking to have a food bank. Yes. Argument we have three main points. First is increasing the food and In case of the crime, if we don't have enough food, then the people will go for crime to have to avoid starving and also increase a decreasing of the food. It will increase the community instability and social connection, relationship. Everything will be affected hardly. 
This is in terms of insecurity. Increase of food waste. Everyone is aware about the food waste from restaurants, from community gatherings. Even at the level of homes, too much food is going for waste. This all can be collected and go to the right people to reduce the poverty. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is increasing of the healthcare cost. No one can deny increase of diseases and health problems due to the lack of enough food. Now, we need to present this to our government to um, convince them about our project. So we decided to have uh, some statistics about the wasted quantity of food annually from restaurants, from the community gatherings, and diseases due to malnutrition and health problems, healthcare costs benefited population, how many people can benefit from this uh, food which is wasted, and disaster that need food support, how many wars, how many uh, natural disasters is happening, all they need, the people will need food support. Ratio of food wasted to people in need for this food. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me reflect back to you some of what I have heard. Um, that if we create a food bank, we will reduce crime. That will not only benefit those people who do not currently have food, it will benefit the entire community. We yes. will decrease food waste, which will make our community much more efficient. That will affect the amount of trash we throw out, the amount of recyclables we collect. It will reduce disease. Um, also, there is a great argument to the government. Governments respond to arguments about money, right? Governments are very concerned with money. If we reduce food waste, we reduce the amount of money that is spent on food waste. So very powerful arguments here. Let me just quickly turn off my reminder for our break. So I would like to take our break now when we come back in 10 minutes, we are going to briefly review all of the group's contributions, and then we will make our decision. Thank you, everyone. Please take a 10-minute break. If you need a couple extra moments at the end, that is absolutely fine. Thank you for your good work. Thank you. Thank you.
And welcome back, everyone. We are regathering. If you need a few more moments, that is entirely fine. You will join us when you can. I'll give folks a moment to come back. All right, thank you. We will dive back in and then folks who are not with us yet can rejoin. So we are debating really between two public projects, a nursing home and a food bank. To summarize briefly, the blue group, their main arguments for nursing homes are it would pay back people who have worked hard on our behalf. It would serve one third of our population, a huge amount. It would allow families to work so they don't have to care for their elders. It would promote loyalty to the government. We could roll the idea of daycare perhaps into the nursing home and have the children spend time with the elderly. And it could provide jobs for the unemployed. Just some of their major points. The Green Group also argued for nursing homes. Their idea was to conflate the daycare and the nursing home to have the residents of the nursing home care for the children. And also they rolled the idea of a food bank into the nursing home, having the residents of the home prepare food for the undernourished. The red group argued for a food bank. Their primary arguments would this would reduce crime, people committing crime to receive food. It would decrease the amount of food waste in the community and it would reduce the spread of disease. All of these very powerful arguments. So it is difficult to vote with this many people. So what I'm going to do is do this in stages. Would anyone in the blue group like to vote for something other than nursing homes? If so, raise your hand. Blue group, anyone want to change their vote from nursing home. I'm not seeing any hands. Let me double check my other screens. I see no hands. All right, thank you. In the green group, would anyone like to change their vote from nursing home? In the green group. Ah, Dr. Saira raised a hand. Uh, okay. Yeah, I would like to go for, for food bank because it covers majority of the population in any way, any kind of vulnerability related to food. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the green group like to change their vote? Uh, I'm from the blue group and I'm okay like to change to, to vote for the food bank. Because I believe that uh, the community security is very important for, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, I know, like, it's very ethical to take care of the senior people. But at the same time, uh, having, a, like, a secured community and safe community is very important for the productivity and prosperity of the community. Thank you very much. So we have two folks who have changed their vote in the green group. Red group, is there anyone in the red group who would like to change their vote from food bank? Would you like to vote for nursing home? Anyone in the red group? I see no hands. So according to a simple majority, we are going to elect the nursing home. I thank you all for your powerful and very moving arguments. Now, I want to step back and take a look at the exercise in a more detached way. Blue Group, uh, I wonder if you could briefly tell us what was your primary cultural value that you received from your moderator and how might that have influenced your argument for a nursing home? Basem. Yeah, so our uh, culture uh, depends on the need for uh, everyone uh, outweigh the need for the few. So we are talking about the majority. So how, what's the benefit for everyone or kind of a democratic principle? Yes. So do you feel, Bassem, and anyone else in your group can answer as well, 
if there had been very, very few elderly folks in the population, do you think you would have voted differently? Absolutely, yes. Um, the fact that statistics we given that our population or the uh, age of our community are growing up. So this we thought only not for our generation, but for the next generations as well. This is why we thought about this. But on the other hand, if we are suffering a lot of poverty or suffering of uh, a marginalized population, we need to be more inclusive. So depending on the facts we have, this is why we uh, we propose this one. But we are flexible, like if the situation change, we are willing to cooperate with other uh, groups in our community. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Green Group, tell us a little bit, and uh, the Green Group was Kata. Tell us a little bit about your main cultural value and how it affected your choice. Our main cultural value was the, that the strong must always protect the weak, and we need to benefit uh, the most vulnerable uh, group in our, our citizen, in our community. And we believe that the elderly are, are vulnerable group and we need to protect them and to um, engage with them in order to make them feel that they are still alive and their life force uh, more effort from us toward them. Yes, and the suggestion you made of conflating the nursing home and the daycare yes. is looking after two very vulnerable groups yes. in the society. Yes. Thank you. And uh, for Red, so Reem, what about you? What was your main cultural value and how did it affect your choice? Our main cultural value was is to promote safe and healthy culture. Because of that, we looked for the warning signs. If we don't have this project, what will happen to the community and how it will affect the, to the whole uh, community culture? Yes, thank you so much. So stepping back again, one more step back. This seminar is about working across cultures. It is about cultural sensitivity. How might this exercise inform that? Why did we do this exercise, in your opinion? I'll, I'll tell you something. I find it very interesting that we were blind to the other groups uh, cultural values and we need to be kind of very cautious and sensitive to this because we don't know like we are not working in a homogeneous community it's very heterogeneous so we we may say something will offend them so that's why we try to okay what's our uh, what is the middle land but the, something we'll all agree we'll all agree that we'll get elderly at some stage so this will cater for most of the population. Um, so we, we, we try to play it safe. Thank you. And yes, so we know our group's deepest cultural value. We don't know other groups. And this, of course, parallels our experience in the real world. We're very intimately acquainted with our own values, less acquainted with the values of others, especially across cultures. So we must, to a certain degree, play it safe remain respectful, assume that they are also working from a deep cultural value. Excellent, anything else, any other ideas as to why we did this exercise in this uh, summer? Yeah, okay, Maya, okay. Um, so I think that uh, this um, like um, uh, reflect, re reflects something very important, like uh, when making any decision, uh, the committee has uh, to include um, like people from different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different cultures. So, like we should respect the idea of biodiversity of diversity of human being. Like uh, so, the community or the committee that make a decision should uh, be well, like uh, um, should be a mirror for the real community, the real population. Uh, and everyone in the population uh, is better to be represented in the uh, like governmental uh, community who are responsible for making decisions. Thank you, Iman. And that is partly because everyone will bring their own cultural values. And the truth, the best choice is going to be a mix of these different cultural values. 
Um, Dr. Saira, I think you wanted to say something. Uh, because I hail from India. So uh, when I was thinking about the cultural value of my group, to me, the vulnerable had a different meaning. To me, vulnerable were people of my country because we have a lot of food shortages. Food insecurity is high mm -hmm. in our country. So I like, I like to go towards the goal of food equity. So for reaching food equity, yeah, to me, elderly is equal to a child under five because in India, malnutrition is very high. You know, more than 45% malnutrition is there in under five children. And elderly also are a now an increasing dependent population and they are also malnourished. So that is why I stood with my point of food bank. Because for me, as I was told, one third of the population was children and one third was elderly. So I was covering a major chunk of the population with the project of food bank. So that is why I stood for it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your perspective. I think I saw another hand. Someone else wanted to speak? I might have a comment. I haven't raised my hand, but I might have a small comment. I know that I'm taking a lot, a lot of time. I'm sorry. Please, that's okay. So uh, just a small comment about representation of every everyone in the committee or the government. I have an issue against this, because this will bring us to kind of the quota regime. So where we need someone from this uh, ethnic minority, we need someone from this religion, we need this one from the political. It shouldn't be this way. It should be that we are caring for everyone, even if they are not represented. Because at some stage, some minority or, or group will be missed. So if we are representing everyone, so they are, are fair and justice to everyone, I, I just I have an issue with this principle. But if we promote for a culture where we buy, we have the diversity as a culture, we are inclusive in our decisions, and we care for everyone, regardless of their religion, ethnicity, background, beliefs, or ideology, but we are loyal to the same community. This is the point I want to add. Thank you, Bassem. And I think one of the big challenges for those countries in the world that are very diverse, like Egypt, which is at the crossroads of the world, like the US, like so many countries, it is difficult to get everyone to the table. I know with the US, we have people here from probably 200 countries. It is very difficult to make all the voices be heard. So ideally, we are caring for everyone, even if they are not at the table. I hear this. Uh, Reem Salam, you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was having uh, this uh, question if the uh, if it's possible for the people applying for such a uh, uh, fund or something to hear justification from the uh, decision uh, from the uh, committee who decided or from the mayor office. Uh, so justification, why did they, they choose this over that? This uh, might uh, give them the opportunity to a second round of uh, you know, uh, more uh, uh, powerful, uh, uh, convincing uh, arguments or uh, to uh, maybe apply uh, differently next time. <laughs> but the decision was just made like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not think I would be a very good government official. <laughs> so I would simply a simple, a simple majority. But I agree that one thing this exercise highlights is that we are all coming into this decision with different sets of cultural values. Mm -hmm. To truly understand how those values intersect or sometimes miss each other, we would need many town meetings. We would need a whole process to get to a decision. It could not be done quickly. So thank you. I hear your feedback mm -hmm. and I respect it. Thank you so much. So one of the reasons that I designed this exercise is that if I was to ask you which culture was right, the red culture, the blue culture, or the green culture, there is no answer. Yes. Because each of those three cultures is working from a deeply held value. But you can also see down the road, those different values could lead to conflict. If the red group decided that they must have a food bank 
and the other groups decided they must have a nursing home, we could get into a real conflict. But each group is working from a positive, affirmative, humane value. So one of the things I have found in myself is that I sometimes, because I know my own values, will assume that I am working from a deep value and my opponent is not. That my opponent, their reasons are more shallow than mine, more superficial than mine, not as important as mine. Most of the time that is completely wrong. My opponent, whoever is in the opposite court from me arguing a point is probably working from a deep set of values too, but I am not aware of those values. So I hope that one of the things this exercise can activate in us is an awareness that deep cultural values can cause people to behave in opposing ways. So seeking out the deep cultural values of someone else, someone that we do not know in a multicultural setting can help avoid conflict. That's what I wanna focus on next. I hope that this exercise helps us think of differing cultural values, not in a binary way, some values are right, some values are wrong, but in a much more nuanced way. I want to introduce you now to a theorist that I have found very useful. Some of you may already know her. She is Cuban American. Her name is Nitsa Hidalgo. And she is an educator who currently lives and works in the US. She is primarily concerned with multicultural education. When you have in a classroom, children from many, many different cultural backgrounds, how do you educate them fairly and equally? She has created a model for describing and comparing cultures that I think is useful. So I'm going to show you a picture of the model and we will briefly talk through it. Then we're going to use the model to dig into some of our own assumptions about culture. So let's share the screen here and hopefully my Wi-Fi will be a little speedier. There we go. So Hidalgo describes three levels of culture. The first she calls the concrete. This is sensory. So these include this includes those aspects of culture that we can sense. We see, we hear, we taste. This could include Things like clothing, music, food, games, dances. These are the aspects of a culture that are most often featured in multicultural festivals. The concrete aspects of culture are also very easy for a cultural outsider to see. So if I come to visit Egypt, I will be able to see these aspects of the culture. What are people eating? What are people wearing? What music are people listening to? That is accessible to a cultural outsider. The next level, which is deeper, is the actions that people take within a culture. This is behavioral. This includes everything from nonverbal communication, gender roles, how do men and women behave, in relation to each other, behavioral taboos, what are you not allowed to do in a culture? How do we greet one another? How do we express affection, etc.? cetera? Every, this is all action that people can take. To a cultural outsider, again, they can see the behavioral level of culture, but they may not fully understand what they're seeing. They can observe it, but not necessarily understand it without help from a cultural insider. Then we get to the third level of culture, and this is the level that we were just discussing. This is the symbolic level. If the concrete is what we sense and the behavioral is what we do, the symbolic is what we believe. This is the deepest and strongest level of culture. 
This includes our customs, our spirituality, our norms, what we feel is acceptable and unacceptable. These are foundational ideas that shape not only our society, but who we are as individuals. To a cultural outsider, these are very difficult to see. We really need the help of a cultural insider to understand the symbolic level of culture. And this is the level that includes our values. So a couple of points I want to make before we let this slide go. These levels of culture interact constantly. They are not actually separate. So for example, think of a special food that you eat on a holiday. That food is a concrete aspect of culture, but it has symbolic meaning. Think of the way that you conduct a wedding in your culture. That is a behavioral level of culture. It also has symbolic meaning. So almost every aspect of culture falls into more than one of these three categories. But usually we can say it falls into one main category and then it has echoes in other categories. So now I'm going to bring you back to me for a moment. And I want to get more familiar with Hidalgo's model. I want to use it so that we can come to understand it more deeply. And the first way I want to do this is I want to brainstorm with you right now some examples of each of these levels of culture. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to start offering either in chat or by raising your hand, examples of the concrete level of culture. We'll collect a few of those, then the behavioral, then the symbolic. But I want you to keep one thing in mind. When I say in your culture, what is a concrete aspect of your culture? That is not a simple question. In every culture, there is what we might call the mainstream culture. And then there are thousands of subcultures. I know America is this way. We have mainstream American culture, but then we have subcultures based on the town where we grew up, the dialect that we speak, sometimes the profession that we're in. So when I ask about your culture, you choose. You choose if you want to talk about your mainstream culture or if you want to think about a subculture with which you identify. So to start with, let's brainstorm just a few examples of the concrete level of culture. So in whatever culture of yours that you are thinking of, what are some concrete aspects of the culture? Yes, Dr. Sayira. Indian music. Indian music, absolutely. Indian classical music. Yes, excellent. Other Egypt concrete food. examples of culture. I think in Egypt food. Food. It, yes, famous food. Egyptian food, yes. absolutely. And Hamsa says eating special sweets in the birth of the prophet. Yes, of course other concrete aspects of your culture that a cultural outsider could easily see? Or ancient civilization also? Yes, absolutely. So the, the relics of the ancient part of your history, people can visit those, they can touch those, they can see those. Other concrete aspects of culture. Uh, Ahmed says, in Egypt, I believe the family and community plus the religious values. Ah, so Ahmed is moving us down into the behavioral and symbolic. So we will get there in just a moment. Thank you for pushing us forward there, Ahmed. Um, Iman says, here in the Quran, absolutely. The way we dress, traditional music, Indian dress multi-religious and multi-ethnic people living together and celebrating together. Traditional customs like hat. Yes, absolutely. So these are all aspects of culture that a cultural outsider sees immediately. 
and says, yes, this is Indian, this is Egyptian, yes, I see. Let us now move down to the behavioral aspect of culture. This is how people act in your culture that is distinct from other cultures. So Hamsa says, baby showers where you celebrate in particular ways, absolutely. Other behavioral aspects of your culture. Celebrating festivals, for example, Eid, festivals and celebrations. Absolutely. Respect of the elderly. Mystical folk music from Sindh, absolutely. Uh, Samreen says the head wobble in Southern India, yes. Right, sometimes it can mean yes in places, sometimes it can be no. The Indian greeting of Namaste, wedding parties. Throwing salt crystals in a wedding to keep away envy. Yes. So behavioral aspects of the culture. So a cultural outsider can see these aspects. Um, Abir says Egyptians love jokes. <laughs> yes, dealing with everything with humor. Family gatherings on Fridays. Yes. So all of these aspects are visible to a cultural outsider, but they may not fully understand what they're seeing. But again, they can see the behavioral aspects. Now comes the tricky one, the symbolic aspects of culture. We'll just brainstorm a couple of these because we're about to do another exercise that delves into this more deeply. But off the top of your head, what are some of the deepest values of the culture that you're thinking of, of your culture? Live and let live says Samreen. Joint families, says Saira. Hani says prayer on Friday. Hamsa says Ramadan preparations. Absolutely. So these are deep values that are part of our identity as individuals, part of our society's identity. An outsider may not be able to see these or may see them and don't know really what they're for or why they matter. They need your help as a cultural insider to understand. Thank you very much for that brainstorming. Now I would like you to grab your paper and pen or open a new document in your electronic device. We're going to make a list. I'm going to give you five minutes, which at first will seem like a long time and then maybe not long enough. I want you to make a list in answer to this question. What are some of my culture's deepest held beliefs? Now, let me say a couple of things here. First of all, you will not have to share this list. This is your private list. I will not ask you to share specifics. Secondly, this is about your perception of your culture. You do not need to say a correct thing, you need to say what you believe, what you see, what you observe. And you can decide which culture you're exploring, if you are exploring your mainstream culture or a subculture. So for five minutes, I'd like you to write a list of everything you can think of in response to the question, what are some of my culture's deepest held beliefs? Before we start, what questions do you have? All right. Thank you. I'm going to put up a slide with this question on it and give you five minutes to write as much as you can write.
You have two more minutes. Thank you. And you have 30 more seconds to finish your list. Thank you very much for your good work. Now I invite you to take a look at your list and to choose three items that you feel are the most important values to you at this moment. If I asked you to do this again tomorrow, you might choose three different items. But what three items out of all those values do you consider most important today? I'll give you a minute to choose those. Thank you for your good work. Does anyone need more time? All right, thank you so much. Now I'd like you to set that list aside. That was the warm up for what is to come. Now I want to shift to a culture that you don't know as well. So think of a culture with which you are familiar, but perhaps not intimate. So for example, I have a number of friends who are Canadian and my country is right next to Canada. I might choose Canadian culture. So think of a culture that you know that is not your own. Now, I'd like you to do the same thing you just did for your culture, for this other culture. I'll give you five minutes again. I'd like you to write down every cultural value you can think of that you feel belongs to that other culture. And please remember, this is your perception of that culture's values. No one is going to argue with, with you about it. <laughs> you can, this is only your perception. You don't have to share your list with anyone and you don't have to identify the culture you are considering. So for five minutes, please write down every cultural value you can think of about this other culture. Thank you, please begin.
I can see that some of you are already done. So I'm going to shorten our time a bit. I'm going to give you one more minute. Thank you. You have 30 more seconds to finish up your lists. All right, thank you so much for your good work. And as we did before, if you would please look at your list and mark what you feel would be the three most important values of that other culture. If you only have three values written down, you can choose them all. So take a moment to identify the top three values of that other culture. Please remember, this is just your opinion, your perception. No one will argue with you. Thank you so much. Let us pause there. So now let's take a step back and look at this exercise in the context of this overall seminar. Was this part of the task, figuring out the values of another culture, easy for you or challenging? And tell me why. It is very tricky. It's not an easy at all. Tell so me more fact, about that, Basem. Yeah, what made but, it difficult for you? Yeah, as, as you mentioned, the fact it's a precision. So this is how I perceived what uh, my colleagues or the other community or the other culture uh, act or react. So I might assume something. And uh, I've, I've, I've learned this the hard way. Like sometimes you assume one thing and you act on this and uh, this might be very offensive to the others or underestimating their culture. So to search yeah, for the deep values, you need some one from the other culture and, uh, and you need to be particularly explicit on, I need to know about your culture. Uh, someone, as you mentioned, insider. So it's not an easy task at all to assume um, the beliefs or the core um, beliefs or uh, culture uh, principles of the other, uh, other community, it's very difficult. Thank you, thank you for that feedback. And Iman has written, uh, easy because I lived in bro both cultures. I am already reflecting on the differences between both cultures all the time in a positive way. Yes, so Iman, you have the experience of being a cultural insider in two different cultures, very helpful. So you can be your own help when it comes to climbing inside the other culture. Um, Marmar Ahmed wrote, very challenging. One cannot guess the deep level of another culture. Absolutely. Would anyone else, um, Professor Sayira, would you like to say something? Yes, I'd like to say because it's very challenging actually, because we have not been in that culture for a long contact period. We are born and raised up in one culture, but not in the other. Uh, so it depends on how much time we have spent in that lecture so that we can give an insight into what is happening there. Yes, it seems to be a matter of time and also intention mm -hmm. that I know folks who have lived in other cultures and have really never learned about them. And that one of them is, is a relative of mine. <laughs> and she has simply decided that she is going to stick to her own thing and not learn. Um, so it does seem to take not only time and patience 
and the help of a cultural insider, but also intention, the desire to learn. Anyone else want to comment on if this was easy for you or challenging? I, okay, okay. I I I live in uh, I am Egyptian citizen and I live in case A, so I am um, a, have an experience in uh, Saudi culture. Okay, uh, it's easy for me to grasp the concrete and behavioral culture. However, the symbolic culture was so difficult, and sometimes it seems I'm not understanding why they are doing such that. But as you said, with more time, more effort, more uh, intention, and more communication with those people, I sometimes and nearly start to understand their symbolic values and belief, and uh, start to accept some some things that I couldn't accept when I just arrived and joined uh, Saudi Arabia for, in the first time. Yes. Yes, thank you for that feedback. We have some more in the chat. Um, Abir says, challenging because we get our opinion from media and movies. Yes, this is a huge problem these days because media and movies almost always are dealing with the first two levels of culture, what is concrete, what is behavioral. They very rarely get down to what is symbolic across cultures. So it can mislead us. And Ahmed says, challenging, it's sometimes it is not about cultural conflict, most of the times about culture mismatch. Oh, interesting vocabulary. I like that very much. So thank you for your good work on this topic. Um, one thing that I, I think is important about this exercise is that our cultural values, the symbolic level of culture is so deeply a part of us that we have to work sometimes to see it as apart from ourselves. It is woven into our identities. It is woven into our sense of ourselves. We know it intimately. It is almost impossible to know the same thing about another culture unless you spend decades there. In the workplace, we can have multicultural conflict that is based on cultural values and knowing that we cannot fully understand another culture's values can actually help us. It can help us take a moment, step back and think to ourselves, there might be a cultural values issue here. That might be what is happening. Any comments on that before we move forward? Um, ma'am, I want to say something. My name is Dr. Yes. Furman. I want to say something, ma'am. Hi. Please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, I am Asian Pakistani living in Arab culture since eight years. Uh, it's really it's a different and uh, some uh, which is completely different culture from my own culture, which we have in our country or something. Uh, most of the our our my country people are my Asian people. They live in their own communities. They don't mingle or they don't uh, like to mingle with the people those who are the different uh, cultural, like Arabs or some other communities. So it's always better to 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 learn and to adopt the other cultures as well because I, as a Pakistani say for I want to always try to live with Pakistanis. I don't want to learn the other other cultures. We don't uh, try to adopt other culture. We don't try to you know um, to, uh, to read about the other cultures. So it's very important because as a doctor I have to work all the time with the the people where I'm working. So that's why it's very important to learn. Uh, like, like I'm working in, in Arab culture, CRCR. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Learning about another culture does not mean that we lose our own. Our culture is deeply inside us. It is part of who we are. But to succeed in a multicultural setting, if we can cultivate curiosity about the other cultures, as Dr. Farman just said, that will help us succeed when we need to collaborate with people whose cultural values are different than ours. Now uh, I want to I say something you. else. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I think like personally, I think that uh, to understand other cultures is very important to learn their language. Once you mm -hmm. master people's language, you can understand like everyday language, like uh, how they communicate, not like the basic language. No, I think a culture equals language. So, and it's not, it's not easy to master the language of every country we visit. That's why we, we the communication at certain point could be like challenging. 
And you have just provided me, Iman, with the perfect segue into the last section of our seminar today. Thank you for that. So let us now step into a short list of culturally competent behaviors. I'll tell you a bit about the list and then we will go through it. So here I will share my screen again. So over many years, and by consulting people all over the Famer universe, we have come up with a list of seven behaviors that seem to help in cross-cultural settings. Many, many people have contributed to this list. So please read through the list now. Nothing appeared on the screen. Oh, you're not seeing it? Yes. Is anyone else not seeing this? Yeah, me too. I, no, I see only Zoom. Nothing else. Yeah. You see only Zoom. All right, let me come back and try something different. Sometimes, uh, as I said, my Wi Fi lags a bit. So I will tell it to do something and it will not do it. Let's see if this works. Here, yes. Now you can see. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Much better. Maybe the Wi-Fi from different cultures. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent. Thank you for that. But we, have, we always have a belief that the internet connection in USA or Canadian European is much more faster than in. Middle it East. is so in and out. There are days when it's excellent and days when it is not, and it drives me just crazy. So please take a look at these seven behaviors. Read through them. And I'll comment on them very briefly. You will notice that most of them have to do with communication skills. The only way that we can overcome the cultural divide, that we can work successfully with people with different cultural values and behaviors, is through increased communication, more effective communication. So the first one, speak slowly. Chances are you do not share a primary language with someone from another culture. Slowing your rate of speech, very helpful. Listening actively, encouraging the other person to keep speaking to you. Nodding, using gestures, facial expressions. Yes, talk to me, talk to me. This is one that we all use intuitively in other cultures, observe others before acting. If I don't know how people greet one another in a new culture, I watch the cultural insiders. They will help me understand what to do. Use verbal and nonverbal communication. If we do not share a primary language with one another, we must also use our bodies. Again, we all do this. If you are traveling in a country where you don't speak the language, people act things out for each other to try to understand, very helpful. Looking for meaning beyond the words. If we do not share a primary language, words will not be enough. We must try to understand the person's intention, what the person means, not just what they say. If you get lost, ask questions. Living in confusion for hours at a time will not help you grow. Ask questions, clarify terms. And for me, the most important one that all of these famer folks came up with was the last one. To withhold negative judgment of someone else's values or behaviors and instead invite your own curiosity. Once we judge, the door shuts on that interacted, interaction. The way we reopen the door to learning and to connection is by allowing ourselves to become curious again. So rather than saying, I can't believe that person just did that, to ask ourselves, I wonder why they did that. These behaviors, I can guarantee that all of you already do. I'm going to bring you back to myself for a moment as we finish up our time together. I can guarantee that most of you use these behaviors much of the time. But one of my jobs at Famer, again, is to take an unconscious process and bring it to the conscious mind. To encourage you to work on these 
culturally competent behaviors in a conscious way. So to challenge yourself to withhold your judgment, if you realize you're judging, try to pull it back in and ask the question, I wonder why they're doing that instead. These are the behaviors that famer folks have agreed have helped them across cultures. So I offer those to you for consideration. We have just a couple of moments left before we tie up our time together. I would love to hear from you about anything in the workshop today that you will carry forward with you, any takeaways. It can be an idea, a moment, anything. It will help the group begin to process their experience. So what might you take away from today's seminar? Uh, thanks so much. I like uh, not being judgmental. I like it so much. It is very hard. Yeah. It is very hard. And I think, at least in my experience, I will judge no matter what, but I can interrupt the process. The judgment can happen, and then I can say, oh, I just judged, and I can change my mind say, I'm going to be curious now. I'm going to try to be curious. So thank you for that comment, Ahmed. It is it is not easy. Uh, even I like your comment. Once you judge, uh, the door is shut, really. Thanks so much. This is my experience, for sure. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank I you. Can, um, I can reflect on this. Um, if we are a part of a diverse community, why we don't be the insider who help the other party to understand us do we reduce the clashes or reduce the mismatch between us and the, the others? So we can teach them, so we can explain to them what this means to us, what this value to us. Yes, thank you. And sometimes it does not feel safe to share. Uh, so that is another challenge that we have, to allow ourselves to be brave enough to share. Uh, Dr. Saira. I like to take the whole last slide, seven culturally competent behaviors. I'd like to learn it by heart. <laughs> Thank you. So would I. I still work on these every single day. And yeah. um, I fail very often, but then I learn from my failures. It's learning. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else, something you might take away from our seminar today? Yeah, actually I, my list of the cultural value. Um, this list I've changed it in the last 10 years. Mm. So I have some list or some top priority. And I think this list changed it in the last 10 years than those when I start working and start um, dealing with the um, real world outside my small family or outside Egypt. So I think uh, the list of cultural value, I think it changed it every decade, I think it's changed. I, I think it has changed for me as well over time as I become more familiar with other cultures, as I begin to see my culture in comparison to many other cultures, um, that my list has changed as well. Um, Iman. Yeah, the categorization of the uh, three levels of uh, culture. Yeah. So something that by intuition we practice every day, but to categorize these levels and uh, like considering the, the deepest level, a spiritual level, this will make us like less judgmental about others. So something is hidden uh, beyond what we see from people uh, in the community. So, yeah. Thank you. And there are some comments in the chat I encourage you to take a look at. And our final comment of the day from Christina. Hello. Uh, this time I enjoyed the idea of searching the behind meaning of every word. In every culture, there is different meaning for some words and it actually differs. Uh, maybe the, the whole opposite. It's very important to know the, the hidden meaning for every word. Yes, I appreciate this, especially coming from the American culture, which is very sarcastic. So people here like to say one thing and have it mean something completely different. This is impossible for cultural outsiders to understand at the very beginning. It's very, very confusing. 
So that has helped me becoming aware of that has helped me realize I cannot do that in international settings because I will not be understood. So I appreciate what you say. And there are some wonderful comments in the chat um, from Marmar, Ahmed and Ola. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your wonderful work today. It has been a privilege to work with you. I am always available for consultation if you need me and your leaders can direct you to me. Thank you and please have a wonderful evening. Thank you. you as thank well. you. Thank you. I enjoyed this session a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I will you. see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. It has been a wonderful session. I think everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. It was it's really fun. I enjoyed myself very much. Have a great evening and I will see all of you very soon. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.